Turn with me, please, to the passage uh, that we read from the book of Judges, Judges chapter 14. And for a text today, I want to use verse 14. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now, Samson is one of the enigmas of the Bible. A man who's ranked as one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and yet a man who is guilty of such major failings. Now, there are three major things we can learn when we look at his life. The first one is, we can see the way that God uses people who are faulty. Now, Samson was very much a man of his time. In the period of the Judges, as we read in chapter 17, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That was the character of the age. And we see that in that period, even God's deliverers, the leaders of the people, they were coloured by the spirit of the age in which they lived. And we need to be aware that the same can be true of us. See, that doesn't excuse them in the same way as it doesn't excuse us. We all have a responsibility to look beyond the sins of our age and of our society and to strive to be faithful to the Lord in all things. But it does remind us that God blesses the service of imperfect men and women. And thank God for that. Because if the Lord only blessed the perfect service of perfect servants, then how could there be any blessing in a world like ours? As an old preacher put it, the Lord can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. So that's one lesson. The second lesson, as fellow believers, Samson was a man of faith, as fellow believers we can learn from Samson's successes and his failures and from the Lord's dealings with him as we can from all the believers that are recorded for us in Scripture. Remember that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, about the children of Israel in the wilderness. These things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. He presents some of the history of the people in the wilderness, and he says, now, this isn't just history. This is recorded to help us and to be an example to us and to teach us. The same is true of Samson. The same is true of the whole of Scripture. And the third thing, Samson was God's appointed deliverer for the people. And as such, we can see things in his life and ministry that point to the Lord Jesus Christ, our true deliverer. So with that in mind, what I want us to do is to look at this incident in chapter 14, the incident of Samson and the lion, and look at it in the context of trials and comfort. We don't want to press the details too much, but look at the event as an illustration of what the Bible teaches about trials and comfort elsewhere. So I think this idea, trials or conflict and comfort, it's very relevant at the moment, because in speaking with Christians in recent days, many have told me that over the last six months or so, they found a time of trial where they've had to face unexpected issues. Loneliness, isolation, health concerns, contemplating death, anxiety, financial pressures, concern for family members. And that through those trials, the Lord has been teaching them and comforting them. Although in many cases, those trials are still ongoing. So I think this idea of conflict and comfort is very relevant to us. Now the context, well in chapter 13, the Lord promised Manoah and his wife that they would have a son who would, quote, begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. That son was Samson. In due time he was born and grew, and then in chapter 14 we have the first events of his adult life recorded. We find that he seeks a wife from Timnah and through that the Lord himself was seeking an occasion against the Philistines because at that time, chapter 14 and verse 4, 
the Philistines had dominion over Israel. And the Lord is using these events as an opportunity for Samson the Deliverer to begin to set the people free. Now God had promised the Deliverer and the Deliverer has been born and he's come to adulthood. And now in chapter 14, at the start of this work of delivering Israel from the hand of the Philistines, we have the first record of Samson having to face conflict. He comes towards Timnah and approaches the vineyards and a lion comes roaring towards him. The Holy Spirit comes upon him mightily for the first time. You'll see it again at the end of the chapter. The Holy Spirit comes upon him mightily and he kills the lion with his bare hands. Then, sometime later, when he's going to, uh, going to collect his wife, he's passing the same way and he sees that bees have made honey inside the carcass of the lion. And he scoops the honey out and he eats some and gives some to his father and mother. Now that's a picture that illustrates for us many things about conflict and comfort in the Christian life. The first big thing, the purpose of conflict for Christians. We know that we can't deny the reality of conflict. Conflict is part of life in a fallen world like ours. We've got strained relationships. We've got frustrations in life. We've got an uncertain future. Life is full of conflict. And on top of that, for believers, there are the added conflicts that come from the fact that believers have enemies that the world doesn't have, at least not in the same way. There's the enemy of the world. Those things around us that oppose our faithfulness to God whether that's means of by temptation or through fear. As we read in 2 Timothy 3 in verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, you see to be faithful, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The world will be against them as it was against Christ. We've also got the enemy of the flesh, the remains of sin within us, that would frustrate our faithfulness to God. And that enemy is a very real enemy. As we read in Galatians 5 and verse 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. There's a very real enemy on the inside. And in addition to all that, there's the enemy of the devil, that malign creature of great intelligence who actively seeks to disturb and prevent our faithfulness to God. He's described as a tempter and a liar and a murderer, an adversary who walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Conflict. But it's also vital, not just that we recognise that conflict in life is inevitable, but that these conflicts are not outside the control of God. He has his sovereign hand on everything that happens in life. Not just life in general, but life in particular. My life and your life. Not a single sparrow falls to the ground without my father. All the hairs on your head are numbered. Everything which happens is under his sovereign control. And more than that, even in the conflicts and the difficulties and sometimes the corruption of life, when evil men do evil things for even reasons, God is able, out of all those things, to bring real, lasting good. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. There's a great mystery as to how God in his providence is able to do that. But do that he does. He uses conflict for a good end. 
Now, Samson's conflict with a lion was the first real conflict of his adult life. And so what was its purpose? And what did it teach him? Well, firstly, it taught him what conflict was like, what conflict was all about. Samson is famous for his remarkable feats of strength. Strength against the Philistines as he delivers Israel. For instance, he rips up the gates of the city of Gaza, the posts and the lintel and all, and he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it away to the top of a hill. Also, he's a man who killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Remarkable acts of strength and energy. But his preparation for those big conflicts started here. In this conflict with the lion that sought to destroy him. And you see this pattern is a very common pattern. A conflict comes as a preparation for a bigger conflict later on. Remember David. When David goes to the army, when Goliath is opposing the armies of Israel, and he speaks to the king there, and he says, Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. His conflict with Goliath is bigger than anything he's faced before. But God has been preparing him through other conflicts in the past. So it is with Samson. This first conflict is a preparation. And it's similar in nature to the conflicts he will face further down the line. So what do we say here? Conflicts start early in the Christian life. Very often, the first days after a person is converted are a bit like the honeymoon. It's all pleasant and lovely. And all the problems and the difficulties of life seem far away and everything is calm and joyful. But it isn't long before conflicts come. And when they come, they can sometimes take us in a way as we don't expect it. But we shouldn't be surprised by that. Because it's like the transition from babyhood, where the parent carries us, to being a toddler. Instead of carrying us now, we need to learn to walk. And in learning to walk, it means that the father puts us on our own feet and he steps back from us. And then the steps we have to take are difficult. And we fall and we get bumps and we get knocks. But the purpose of all of that is that we become stronger as a result and better able to serve the Lord in the conflicts that are yet to come. But start early. And it really does prepare us for the future. Now think of this attack by the lion. The lion was powerful. It's described as a young lion. Not a cub, but a young adult lion in full strength before old age has started to take its toll on it. A man being attacked by a full-grown lion. It doesn't sound like something small and preparatory. Well, it wouldn't be for me and you. For somebody like me and you, it would be a major thing. But for Samson, it was only a foretaste of the greater conflicts he's got to bear. And we need to recognise that. The Lord deals with different people in different ways, depending on who they are and what they need and what it is that the Lord is preparing them for. So some people have to deal with doubts so that that will prepare them for the future. Some have to deal with fears, others with financial pressure, others with temptation. Some have to deal with a sense of being deserted by God. Some have to deal with spiritual attacks from the devil and his forces. Some have to deal with mockery. And to onlookers, when we see that happening, we can say, whoa, that's more than I could bear. Well, maybe we feel like that. But the Lord knows what he's doing in the life of every one of his children. 
and he knows that if in the future we are to carry out certain duties, then we need to face certain training and to be prepared in a way, the way that our father knows best. And that's what's happening here. He's attacked by a young lion. Now, one of the other things this teaches us is that we should never be surprised by the strength of the conflict that we might face. You may remember that Asaph in Psalm 76, he was struggling with the idea that wicked men were prosperous and healthy, and it seemed as if God was taking no interest in bringing his justice to bear in their lives. And he said in verse 2 of Psalm 73, As for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. The pressure was on him in such a way that it was a remarkably sharp and heavy conflict. The Lord brought him through, but it was heavy at the time. And remember that when the Apostle Paul speaks about spiritual battles in Ephesians 6, he says, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Some conflicts can appear to be like an evil day. We should never underestimate their power. Second thing, it was destructive because it was a lion that was roaring against him. The young lion was there and it was out to destroy and it was seeking to cause fear. Many of us, I'm sure, know what this is like. Because in some conflicts, great, powerful conflicts, the danger is obvious. And we feel as if we are in danger of being overwhelmed, swept away. We might fear that some particular temptation will lead us into some form of spirit, sinful indulgence or habit, and we'll backslide and we'll drift away from the Lord, and who knows where we'll end up. We may feel that some doubts that come to us are so destructive that if we give in to that, it'll lead to a denial of the Lord who bought us and who knows what will come of us. We fear that some things will lead us step by step into a pit of self-pity and maybe we'll never be able to escape from it. Destructive and obvious. If the lion had its way, it would destroy Samson and that'll be the end of him and the end of his opportunity to serve the Lord and the end of this opportunity for the deliverance of Israel. So why, if conflicts are so dangerous and potentially destructive, does the Lord allow us to face these conflicts in our lives? Well, I think the reason is this. We learn how to fight by fighting. And everything that threatens to destroy us, on the flip side, helps us in later battles when we are taught by the Lord, by his grace and strength, to stand and to overcome. Every day's battle is a step to make us stronger for the service of the Lord in the future. And the best way to learn is by doing and the Lord knows that. So he brings Samson and he brings us to face these conflicts. Also, it was unexpected. Now to his surprise, it says in the verse, the, the word there is look or suddenly. The idea that it's something which came on him quickly, took him by surprise. The young lion suddenly comes roaring against him. Now some conflicts are like that. And those sudden conflicts that come on us unexpected and powerfully, they are particular challenges. Because they can catch us off guard, and then in the turmoil of it, they can make us question, what have we done wrong? Where is God? Why is this happening to me? Blasphemous thoughts and offensive temptations can be like this. They can come to us, a man or a woman, very suddenly and startle us. 
It happens sometimes to believers in the morning when they wake up. They haven't been thinking about anything, but then suddenly up with the blue, there it is. And they can be shocked. It can happen to us as we prepare to go to serve the Lord. As we set time aside to pray, we read our Bible, and then we close our eyes to pray, and suddenly there it is. It can happen to a minister as he's going up the steps into the pulpit, and suddenly from nowhere a blasphemous thought comes that would seek to just knock us off balance. Now when that happens, it can be very, very helpful to recognise that those thoughts don't come from our own hearts. The devil would love us to think that. He'd love us to think that and be appalled at ourselves and completely cast down and thrown off our guard. We know the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But the devil is a great master at taking his own thoughts and wrapping them up as fiery darts and casting them towards the hearts of God's people. And if they hit us, they can threaten to set everything on fire. The devil's like a cuckoo, you know. He takes his own little eggs and he seeks to plant them in the hearts of God's children so that God's children think that they belong to us and we are appalled. There are other things that can come just as suddenly and just as unexpectedly, but from different sources. A medical diagnosis shocks us. A bereavement, a redundancy. When these things come suddenly, the danger is that they catch us off guard. And we've got to be very, very careful then. In 1 Peter 5.8, we are told, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, be vigilant. In every situation, don't be caught off guard, but be careful. And recognise that suddenly these things can come. And so in our hearts, and in our relationship with God, and in our dependence on him, and in our confidence in his grace, we need to be sober and vigilant and ready. So that's the first thing. It taught him truths about what conflict is really like. And the second thing, in verse 6, it taught him the reality of true strength. Verse 6 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart, as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. When a lion comes to Samson, he's alone and he's unharmed. He didn't tell his mother and father. They weren't with him at the time. Alone and unharmed. He's learning lessons here. One of them is he's learning that he has to fight alone. The lion comes to Samson and if Samson doesn't fight, Samson is lost. The transition from childhood to adulthood means becoming increasingly dependent. And sometimes young people can think that what that means is having more freedom. It does mean that. But it also means having to take more responsibility. It is good to bear the yoke in our youth. To learn our responsibility to walk with God and to trust him and to serve him when our circumstances change and our world becomes bigger and our eyes are opened to the reality of life around us. He has to fight alone. He can't pass the responsibility to somebody else. Secondly, he's weak in himself. Because what hope would a single unarmed man have against a lion in the prime of life? Now one of the key things that the Lord always needs to teach us is that in and of ourselves, we are not sufficient. We don't have the strength of the resources to win a victory. We can't win a victory against temptation on our own. We can't resist the devil on our own. We can't stand up to peer pressure on our own. Too easily we buckle. We can't deal with the doubts that sometimes come to us on our own. 
That's a reality. We have to learn our weakness and our need and our dependence. And this is true both in the life of the individual Christian and in church life. And I do fear that too often we are tempted to think that we can adequately deal with the challenges we face as we are. We're kind of too healthy. We've got too good an opinion of ourselves. Perhaps one of the things that the Lord is teaching us through this period of conflict and isolation, when many of the props in our day-to-day -day lives have been taken away, is that we are not sufficient on our own. And we are not strong enough. A simple example is this. Evangelistically, if we have a heart for men and women, we can't reach them as easily when we're not so free to hold our meetings and to chat to people and to share with them. When those opportunities are taken away, it makes us more and more aware as to how weak we are in and of ourselves. We are Samson alone and unharmed, and the lion is roaring. So the third thing, he learns that the Lord can give the victory. Because human weakness should never be a cause for despair. Rather, the reality of human weakness should lead Christian people to recognise that the Lord is stronger than even our strongest enemy. And the Lord can give victory in every conflict. Rather than leading to despair, it should lead to confidence in God and dependence upon him. You notice here, the spirit of the Lord comes mightily upon Samson. It's the spirit of God that gives the victory. That's always the way. How do we triumph over doubts? It's the spirit of truth that enables us to triumph over doubts. How do we deal with temptation? It's the Holy Spirit who helps us with temptation. In conflict, where can we find peace? It's the Holy Spirit who descended on the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of a gentle dove that gives peace of heart. And when the things in our lives that oppose us seem like impenetrable and immovable mountains, we know that when the Lord steps into the situation, even the mountains flow down at his presence. The power is from God. Now this means confidence in the conflict. And confidence is something that we have to learn and we have to exercise. Not all battles are easily won. But when the Lord is powerfully present, a lion can be torn apart as easily as a young goat. We're told in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. We're told in James chapter 4 and verse 7, Therefore submit to God, depend on him, resist the devil, and he will flee from you confidence in God and also prayerfulness prayerfulness in the conflict remember Mark chapter 14 the Lord in the garden watch and pray that you enter not into temptation why the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak you can't do it on your own watch and pray have confidence in God depend on him call out to him because you need him if there's going to be victory remember the apostle paul ephesians 6 finally my brethren be strong in the lord and the power of his might then he lists the armor of god and then he says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit our confidence has to be in god because the power for victory comes from him and we have to learn that when faced with the conflicts of life. The second big thing we've got today 
is the place of comfort for Christians. We've seen the purpose of conflict. What about the place of comfort? Well, sometime later, Samson is returning to Timnah to take this woman as his wife. And on the journey, he turns aside to look at the carcass. He's going there to remember the victory that the Lord had given him. And when he does that, he finds it swarming with bees and the inside of the carcass filled with honey. So he scrapes some of the honey out, he eats some, and he gives some to his mother and his father. And then later, in verse 14, he proposes a riddle to the Philistine men who've gathered to the feast, his companions. The Lord is working through this to give uh, Samson a reason to attack the Philistines and start to deliver the Israelites. But he proposes this riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. As a result of the conflict and Samson's victory, the lion, which was the eater, which would have eaten him, became a source of food. Out of the eater came something to eat, honey. And the lion, which would have destroyed him, became a source of strength and delight. Out of the strong came something sweet. Conflicts can be a source of comfort, strength and joy. When, by God's grace and strength, the conflict leads to victory, then that comfort, that strength and that joy is something to encourage our own hearts and also something for us to share. As Samson shared the honey with his mother and father, something for us to share so that we might comfort others also. Now, two areas in which this works. The first one is in the life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising its shame. And now, having been through the cross, he sees of the travail of his soul and he's satisfied. Out of conflict has come sweetness and joy for the Lord Jesus Christ because there was victory in his conflict. But more than that, out of the conflict that the Lord Jesus Christ faced and the victory that he won, there's come comfort and sweetness and joy for his people. Death came to destroy him, but he destroyed it, and out of death came life. The bread of life, which we may eat and never die. Sin and the devil sought to destroy him. But out of sin and the devil and Christ's victory over them flows our joy and our comfort. You see, the joy of forgiveness flows from the cross because the Lord Jesus Christ has triumphed over those powerful destroyers. And having triumphed over them gives us the sweetness of his victory. And we know what that means. When we lose a sense of forgiveness and when we struggle with our assurance of salvation, what do we do? Turn aside, as Samson did, to look at the victory. And out of the victory, draw sweetness and strength. Turn aside to Calvary. And look at the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, that in his death, our death, died with him on the tree. And a great number by his blood will go to heaven made free. That's the victory, which gives us comfort, eternal comfort. That's the victory which gives us joy. There's the comfort of reconciliation. That flows from the cross. 
The devil has been conquered at the cross. We've been delivered from the dominion of the devil and we've been reconciled to God and made his children forever. There's great comfort in that. He can't destroy us. We've been set free. The joy and comfort of new life flows from the cross. We are dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. And we can know him and we can serve him and we can be with him and we can be like him. Surely there's a comfort in that for men and women like us. The comfort of heaven flows from the cross because there he went to prepare a place for us. And if he's done that, he'll come again to receive us to himself that where he is, there we may be also. You see, the joy and the comfort that flows from the cross out of as it says in the verse, the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. It's important to remember, isn't it, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we experience this comfort and this joy, it boosts us in our Christian life, it gives us strength, it encourages us to go on, it prepares us for the next conflict. Remember Jonathan in 1 Samuel 14. His father Saul said, pursue the enemy, don't eat anything until the victory's been won. And the men in the forest, they were distressed and they were faint because of lack of food. And Jonathan, who hadn't heard what his father had said, put the end of his staff into some honey that there was on the ground and ate it. And he said later to his father, so he said later, my father has troubled the land. Look now. How my countenance has brightened because I've tasted a little of this honey. Does your countenance need brightening? Do you need cheering up and encouraging and strengthening? Draw sweetness from the cross of Jesus Christ and recognise the victory and life that's come out of his victory over death. But not only do we experience this sweetness from the victory of Christ, but we experience sweetness and comfort and joy when we look back at the victories that the Lord gives us in our conflicts for him. There's the joy of a good conscience. That's a great thing, to think I was struggling and my feet nearly slipped, but the Lord has kept me. Thank God I didn't fall into that trap again. There's the joy of seeing God at work in our lives. The Lord has, six months ago, five years ago, I would never have stood in that situation. But I've stood today and I was faithful and I was able to speak those words. Thank God that he's helped me. What a joy. There's a joy of seeing victory in our lives in all sorts of different areas. Whether it's standing against temptation, whether it's being more consistent in the workplace, whether it's a situation in our family, whether it's our ability to speak for the truth and defend the truth and honour the Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy that we can do that. And there's the joy of seeing others around us blessed as a result of the faithfulness to God that the Lord enables us to have in the conflict. And you know, it leads finally to the eternal joy of heaven. When the Lord will recognise all the little faithfulness and all the little resistance and all the little victory that's been won in our lives by his grace. And he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Last thing. We should share this comfort with others. To share the comforts of the gospel, well, that's evangelism. To share with men and women the reality of forgiveness, peace with God, acceptance, joy, a new life, a hope of heaven, all flowing from the cross and the victory of Christ over death, that's evangelism. That's a wonderful thing. We should share it because the gospel is good news. It's good news for you if you've never believed in Christ. There's joy and peace in believing. More than that, your sins will be dealt with. You'll be brought back to God. The 
if you know, to share the comforts of the Christian life. That's fellowship. And as Christian people, we need to deepen our fellowship. Psalm 66. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. You know, we don't receive comforts to keep them to ourselves. We receive comforts so that we can share them with others, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. The desire and the intention there is this. He's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted by God. Have you received comfort in tribulation, comfort in the conflict? Are you then able to comfort others when they are in trouble and to say to them, come and hear what the Lord has done for my soul? I faced a lion. I was nearly done for. But the Lord gave me a victory and he preserved my life and I praise him. And still to this day I look back and I draw sweetness from the victory. Brother, if the Lord has done it for me, he can do it for you because he's the same God and he's mighty to save. Trust him. Be comforted. In recent months, has the Lord helped you with isolation or anxiety? Has he helped you with family problems or financial problems? Has he helped you with doubts or with a, a lack of a sense of his forgiveness? Has he deepened your assurance? Has he given you a stronger sense of his love? If he's comforted you, then comfort others so that we might bear one another's burdens and strengthen one another's hands and that together we might go forward to serve the Lord in the days that lie ahead.